So this video is about building a hydraulic press. So we're also going to review this 30 ton cylinder individually and this air over hydraulic pump. So let me wind things back and we'll have a closer look at this first. The air pump came with these hoses. They look good and apparently rated to 10,000 PSI. Also came with this screw adapter and a pneumatic airline with a shut off valve. So for those who can't see this too clearly, we've got a maximum air pressure of 120 PSI, maximum hydraulic pressure of 10,000 PSI. It has a tank capacity of 1.7 liters. Now the air hydraulic ratio is 100 to 1. That's interesting. Now the flow rate at 100 PSI is 0.85 liters per minute. The flow rate at 10,000 PSI is 0.16 liters per minute. So once it's under pressure, it's obviously moving a lot slower. And we've got air consumption at 100 PSI of 11 S CFM. Now the fitting on the cylinder does not match what came with the hose. So we'll replace this one with the one provided. So it looks like it's nice and full with oil and they used on their fitting only standard PTFE tape. For my adapter, I'm gonna use some Loctite 55. So I repeated that process with all the other parts and whilst we're in this orientation, it's good to run it for a few cycles. That will allow any air bubbles to escape before you use it properly. I wanna first bring your attention to safety glasses. Despite the risk being very low, 10,000 PSI will put a jet of hydraulic fluid straight through your head. So it's worth protecting any soft tissue. So this 100 mil or four inch cylinder, ugh, weighs roughly 17 kilograms or 37 pounds. This specific cylinder is spring loaded and if you go smaller, the stroke is a lot faster. This is the biggest one that Viva would let me have. To operate the pump, you need to release the valve here. That allows air to get into the system. Now when the pedal's in the up position, it's releasing the return valve. When it goes down, nothing happens. It's only until that little button there gets pressed that the thing starts operating. So if we push down on that, So the first official test I want to do is measure how fast the stroke is. So I'll be able to look back at the footage and see how many millimeters per minute we're traveling. Three, two, one. And also the retraction speed. Brilliant. So I'm actually fascinated by the mechanism inside of this. Let's take it apart and see how it works. Right, bolts are off, what's inside? Ooh. So as you can see, it does come preloaded with hydraulic fluid, which is helpful. Right, so let's take a look. Hmm, interesting. So this is the one-way return valve. When that divot gets pressed, it's obviously gonna allow fluid to return back into the system. This is your air outlet here. We've got a little suppressor on it. And here's the air inlet valve, still very simply made, simple o-rings, springs. I want to make sure I don't lose parts. That's the return valve itself, it goes in there. Ooh, what did I just drop? Oh, I totally nearly lost that little pin there. That goes in there like that. And that's the hydraulic input, I believe. That, I believe, is a pressure release valve. Open the back end of the air cylinder now. Seems to be a spring in here, I believe. So the question is, once I release this spring, can I get it back in again? Oh, right, I think I've gotten to the bones of how this thing works now. This here is the air piston, which is 100 times bigger than this, which is the hydraulic piston. Now this clever little valve here closes shut when it's being pushed along the cylinder chamber, which the 100 to 1 ratio is forcing hydraulic fluid into the valve. Once that's then fully extended, it's releasing the air pressure. Once that air pressure is released on this side, it also releases this piston here, which equalizes the pressure on both sides, which then allows the spring to push this cylinder back up to the top, away from the check valve, which switches off that air release, which then means this side then becomes under pressure again. That little valve gets pushed in and the whole cycle repeats itself. Very clever. So taking this apart also gives me a good insight on any potential maintenance that needs to be done. So I would say the main thing that would go wrong with this is potentially one of the O-rings getting damaged. So I'm gonna make sure they're squeaky clean before getting put back together. It's back together and working again now. 
Word to the wise, make sure the spring's are the right way around. The little spring in the return valve is tapered. You want to make sure that's pointing upwards in the taper. And the little ball bearing inside there goes at the bottom, not at the top. And that should save you hours of tinkering. All right, so as most men know, anything with a hole is quite useful. And to test the pulling power, I've created this rig. So I'm putting the threaded rod through the top. I'm going to use this bit of box section as a bit of a spacer. Now it goes on our block of wood. Our bearing and then a nut and a washer. Alrighty, we're armed and ready. Let's go for it. There we go. So you can imagine using this on a tractor or a lorry would be very helpful. So a block of wood doesn't really stand a chance against 30 tons. So instead I fished around my uh, treasure pile and I think I've got enough pieces to make a half decent press. That way we can see what it can squash. So this is a piece of fork truck time, which is approximately 120 millimeters by 52 millimeters. I buy these in for about a tenner each. So the whole time this one's been cut in half. It's obviously heat treated high carbon steel, so it'll make an excellent top and bottom I reckon. And what I also have is this section of I-beam. And I think what I'm planning to do is to pass the fork trick time straight through it. So I'm going to cut out this section here, cut out that section there, so it goes all the way through and then weld all the way around. Then I've got some of this 10 millimeter thick plate. I collect these out of the scrap bins at other engineering places and I think I'll get my DIY CNC plasma and we'll cut some cradles and things like that out for the cylinder. This is just a correction fluid. And it just helps me to see the line where I'm about to plasma cut. It's a titanium oxide, so it doesn't come off through the heat. I'll put a link in the description if you want some. Well, that's good. Oh yeah. But before I start welding, I need to preheat this because that's a lot of mass that's gonna suck out the energy otherwise. So some people are still asking how the old CNC plasma's doing. If you haven't seen this already, I built this from a desktop laser. Let's cut some parts with it. Here we are, a little clean up and jobs are good in. Also, for finishing parts off and getting a nice little bevel on the go, I highly recommend this tool. Essentially, it's a handheld beveling tool and you just go around it like this. The best thing I like about this is how hard it is to actually catch your fingers in the thing. Even if I really push my thumb in there, you can see my thumb is nowhere near that blade edge. So essentially, I can hold everything while I do it. There you go, that's before and after, much better. So I've preheated the steel, you can see that shows about 90 degrees Celsius at the moment. So there's actually two reasons why you'd want to preheat your steel first. One is so that the weld will penetrate better because it's not getting cooled down as rapidly. And the other reason is so that the shrinkage is equal throughout the whole material. Especially when you've got a much thinner part welded to a much thicker part. If they cool down at different rates, they will contract away from each other, which means without preheating, you're more likely to get a crack appear in your weld. I'd say that's only applicable to anything over 50 millimeters thick. Right then, let's drill a hole in here. Right, I want to bend these over now. Okay then, final assembly. Aha, 
it is now finished. So I believe that this could well be the most compact, most affordable 30 ton press you'll ever see. But how good is it? Let's see. First of all, I'm gonna take off the collet here. There you go, that's what that looks like. And what I've made is a forging die to fit it. That simply slots on there, tighten the nut onto it. That's an M24 nut and thread, by the way. Simply welded onto a block of mild steel that I had lying around. So I'm gonna thread that back up into this. There we are, all the way. But you can see it still turns a little bit inside the cylinder. We've got a fix for that. Now for the bottom, I've made this shoe here. And to keep the die in place, you just simply loosen this bolt here. That drops this down, and then we can lock it back into position again. That's now putting tension against this plate, against the back here. So I'm gonna lie it down for this next bit. So to stop the die from twisting, make this roller arm. So that simply slots over here. Now what we want to do is bring the dies together. So now this can go all the way back to here and then tighten these bolts. And that makes sure that these bearings are running along here, which will therefore stop it from being able to twist. Right then. Let's heat up a nice big bit of steel. All right, so I have here some two inch thick or 50 mil solid bar. Let's heat it up in the old induction forge. There we are, 60 seconds, and we're getting nice and toasty already. Such a shame that Viva doesn't sell these anymore because they're great bits of kit. That's what I mean, when these things go, they've gone. There we are, that's perfectly toasty now. Let's try that. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Right, now we've got a bit more space. <laughs> right, let's have a go at stamping it. I can honestly say this is a lot of fun. I mean, just in general, squashing some box section down. Hopefully this will make for a decent thumbnail. Look at that. Oh my days, that is awesome. God, I've never seen steel move like that before. It's just really interesting to see it blow out the side like that. So I do think it's right to question whether this is 30 tons or not. Looking at the small print, it's 30 ton capacity, so maybe that's just the load bearing strength. We don't know exactly what the PSI coming out of the pump is, because we haven't got a gauge. So in the future, what I'll have to do is get hold of a gauge, measure what the output PSI is, calculate the surface area of the cylinder, and then we'll know exactly what that is. So far, you'll agree it's very impressive. Currently on Viva's website, these are £112 for the pump, which I think is a bargain. Apparently this cylinder, the four inch 30 ton, was only £146. Now they told me the stock is running low. I don't know whether that means they're gonna restock it all. But a 30 ton press for 260 quid, plus a bit of scrap material. 
mean, that is, that's insane. I did consider getting a 30 ton log splitter and the lowest price I've seen those is two grand. To put things into perspective, the official forging presses are five grand upwards. Now I seriously considered building my own air over hydraulic mechanism. Those who have seen my power hammer videos know that I've got a 50 ton hydraulic jack and I considered building the same mechanism. One person said, surely it's easier just to put an electric motor on it. Now that's actually more difficult than it sounds. Mainly to do if you're pushing the electric motor to its absolute limit, how do you stop it from overheating? Whilst with a compressor system, you don't have that problem. And technically my compressor, which is 150 liter capacity, has a three horsepower motor on it. So technically this is the same as having a three horsepower motor direct drive. Although the whole pumping mechanism isn't as good as an electric power pack, and it's still very good. And what I would consider building now is a brake press. I might bore a hole in the bottom and create some punches. We could also build a three point pipe bending die in there. Oh, we've got endless fun with this thing. So I have a lot of new subscribers now, so you'll have to let me know in the comments section if this is the kind of content that you wanna see. And what I have in the pipeline is a much bigger DIY CNC plasma table, and we've got a steam power plant to build and a wood gas power plant to build. Now I don't have Patreon, so what I've been doing is getting other sponsors to pay for that kind of content. But it means that I'm gonna be reviewing a lot more lasers and some resin 3D printers. And hopefully we're gonna use those 3D printers to actually do some metal casting as well, which will be interesting. Now amongst all this amazing technology that I get to play with, I want to tell you something. At some point, I'm gonna be taking a break from all this technology and I'm gonna be getting back to my traditional handcrafted roots. In the back I've been volunteering on a sustainable coppice and I'm going to be doing a lot more with green woodwork And so I'll be forging all of my own tools. Unfortunately because that is all self-sufficiency I can't get any sponsors for that. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out yet So I would be very interested in your input in the comment section below And it really does make a difference if you share like and subscribe to this channel Especially if you want to see that content. So normally at the end of my videos I encourage you guys to stop watching YouTube and to get out there in the real world and to forge for yourselves a life worth living. But anyway, if you do insist on watching YouTube, may I recommend this video right here. And until next time, I wish you all the very best. I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.